Again, a very happy Sabbath to everyone. And uh, yes, uh, I saw a wedding this morning. So if you wonder whether your pastor is up in the middle of the night praying, uh, yes. And uh, at other times, um, watching other people pray over interesting individuals where we see a tableau that is usually something that we would see uh, produced by Hollywood, but in this case, one of Hollywood's finest was able to bring some of Hollywood to London. So I want to wish uh, Prince Harry, Princess uh, Meghan very well as they begin their journey uh, as the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. So America and England are once again joined together. Uh, We are very, very pleased, very, very happy for how everything worked out today. And so I wanted to make that part of what I said this morning because it does fit It does fit because, you see, Megan just went through the big exam. She was found by a mutual friend, introduced to Harry, and then very shortly thereafter went on a journey with him into his ministry. His ministry is mostly in Botswana, and there they we're able to talk about the possibilities of the future. So today, I wanted to talk to you about the big exam. We've heard, just read Matthew 25. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. It's really the story, the culmination of the story of salvation. It's the story of the, what I might want to phrase, the big come down. You look at what happened today where what English royalty would call a commoner marries a prince. So all of those stories that you have read, all of those those, uh, ideas that you have had about how royalty can be mixed up with commonality was played out before us just a few hours ago. But it's played out in our minds every time we think about Jesus, the royal prince that comes down to earth. He is the universal royal, if you like. Makes a statement. Every piece, every piece of what Jesus did made a statement about who he was, who he is, and who he will be forever. Everybody was watching. What, what kind of dress would Megan have? What, uh, what would her hair be like? Everything, everything is, is being watched very, very carefully when it comes to how Megan dresses. In fact, there are those who guesstimate that she will be worth to the clothing industry in the amount of over $200 million. Because people will say, I want the purse that Megan has. Little Australian company was about to go under when it was seen that Megan had one of her purses bought from this company. And suddenly they were sold out and had orders for the next year. That is the effect that a representative can have when they Choose a purse. So when Jesus chose to be born of Mary, when Jesus chose to be born in a manger, when Jesus chose to wear simple clothing, when Jesus chose to order his life according to that which he and his father had decided to do, it was completely choreographed. It was something that Jesus woke up every morning and asked his heavenly father, what's on the agenda today? 
They were talking today about how it was down to the minute how everyone would arrive. Well, don't you know that Scripture says that Jesus arrived just on time? It was all, you, you could also think of it as a rescue. You could think of it as a, as a, a winning of the hearts of rebels. You could think of it as a, a moment to rekindle a relationship, a, a father with his children. Uh, the, the relationship between God and humanity would, would never be the same again after Jesus came into the picture. And so that is what they tried to do, and that is what they still try to do, and that is what we can join in with. We can join in with helping others to have a new picture of God. You could actually say that it was the story to tell the story. It was the theater of the universe that began that day. Just to recap, for those of you who may have watched or been here for the last couple of weeks, let's understand that last week we talked about idleness not being an option. The engagement with the will or the purpose of God for our lives in this world and in, the, in, in, in this time is something that is not an option. We need to engage. We need to uh, have authenticity in our relationship. Our relationship needs to reflect loyalty to God our, and, and reflect our sincerity. Idleness, complacency, uh, possible obstruction of the kingdom of heaven will be seen in the way that it is at the end of the parable of the talents as treason. Strong word. But it's what happens to the third servant, if you remember last week. Today, we refer to being Christian, but not acting like that is known as hypocrisy. What is looked for in us by not only God, but by the world is authenticity, being who we say we are being transparent. Today is our day. Amen. A couple of weeks ago we said that we should really be thinking about the fact that today is the day, not tomorrow. Amen. We need to realize that, that this is the moment that God has given us life on this planet and it is something where we can make a difference, where we can do something special for Him. And it is not that we should be grappling with tomorrow so much as we should be saying, God, what is it that you want us to do today? We don't know about tomorrow. Tomorrow is not ours yet, but we have today. So it is that, that on this particular Sabbath, on this particular weekend, when, when we have changed the color of the ribbon on the, uh, on the podium, have you noticed that? Thank you, thank you, Eric, for continuing to lead us through that yearly journey that we take, that this weekend we celebrate Pentecost. Fifty, penta, fifty days after Jesus was resurrected, 50 days after the biggest event in human history concerning the salvation of humanity, we celebrate the big exam. Matthew 25 paints a picture in this particular situation of a shepherd. So last week we talked about a king and his servants, but Jesus moves on now and uses the imagery of a shepherd and that he has a flock and that he is making a determination as to who is who and what is what. In the parable of the talents, we discovered purpose for life. We discovered relationship with the king. And we discovered the difference between the attitudes of servants one and two and servant number three. We discovered that attitude towards the king and his kingdom 
can have good results with a well done or can have very negative results where the wishes of his heart were honored by God, by the king, and he was separated from his presence. And so we come to the parable of the sheep and the goats. This, I think, is an outline of the curriculum. To speak in, in, in exam terms, to speak in, in school terms, if you want to know what's on the big exam for, for God, here it is, Matthew 25 describes the, the actual participation of individuals in God's kingdom, uh, his subjects. They participate in this curriculum, and at the end, there's going to be an examination as to, as to whether or not they were uh, happy with the curriculum and enjoyed their, their, their involvement. So the exam is really, how have you done? Uh, have you followed the shepherd? Uh, Going back to the parable of the talents, have you served the king? And I suppose today we could discuss, we could discuss the areas of interest in this examination. However, the basic question is, did you represent the family of God well or not? That's the examination question in a nutshell. Did you, did you do life like Jesus? Did you follow in his footsteps? The exam is, is only for those, by the way, who claim to be sheep. This exam, uh, we, we believe, you could say, is going on right now. Uh, you, you know that in, in the Adventist church we talk about an investigative judgment. Well, this could be a, a picture of that. You have a shepherd, and he's looking over, and those who claim to be part of his flock are going to be examined. The interesting piece that we discover right away is that the sheep do not know that they are sheep. How's that? They want to be sheep, they've decided to be sheep, but it's not like they go down uh, to, to the, 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 the bedroom mirror every day and say, look, I'm a sheep. They just are. They just are sheep. It's how, they, it's how they think. It's how they act. Goats are pretender sheep. They look like sheep, but they're not. They're only sheep, apparently, when the shepherd is around. They're only Sheep for his sake, not their own. And so really, they're not sheep at all. They're, they're goats. So what is, the she, what, what is the secret? What is the secret of being a sheep for real? I'm going to tell you two in, in, in three words. Change of mind. Change of mind. So we come to Pentecost. It is... It is my humble opinion that the entire time that Jesus was here on earth, his disciples did not understand why he was here. Now, you may want to say, Pastor, that, how, how can that be? You know, we, we talk about Peter and we talk about James and John and, and, and we think so highly of them. I would put it to you that they did not understand until Pentecost. They did not understand what Jesus was doing with his heavenly Father. He told them so many times, I don't do anything except that my heavenly Father tells me to do it. Remember that time when, when he went and found the lady by the well? If you know your Palestinian geography, you know that there are three different ways that you can go from Jerusalem up to Galilee. And Jesus went right up the middle, and he ends up at Jacob's well. How, how come? Well, I'll tell you. It's because God, his heavenly Father, told him that was that day's agenda, and Jesus obeyed. Jesus followed. And so he found himself confronted with a lady 
who'd had five husbands, the one that she was living with was not being very nice, and neither were the other ladies in town. And he becomes the seventh man in her life, and she roars back into town saying, I've found the one, I've found the one. Now, how does that happen? It happens because Jesus understood who he was, understood the agenda that he had been given and was willing to follow. And I would say the disciples did not do that until Pentecost. The best thing that they did on that 50th day was to obey Jesus who went up into heaven and, and, and then said before he went, listen, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Comforter. That, that little tiny obedient act on the part of the disciples put them in a place where the Holy Spirit could, could come and be with them, and we, we, call it, we call it Pentecost. At that moment, we see in the lives of these people, we, we, we're, we're told there were some, some 120 people in the upper room, that same room where Jesus had had Passover dinner with his, his uh, disciples. They're back in that room and, 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 and they're, they're waiting. They're doing the waiting that Jesus said that they should do. When the Holy Spirit comes in this, in this tongues of fire, hence the red ribbon, they have a change of mind. It is miraculous change of mind, they have a change of agenda, they have a change of understanding. I believe too they had change of abilities. As, as a pastor, you will, you will never hear me preach to you or, or teach to you about gifts outside of the framework of mission. I believe the gifts of the Spirit are given to those who have said yes to going on God's errands, who have said yes to being a part of His mission in this world, and that when whatever He asks you to do, He can make happen. How's that? If He asks you like Peter, who's a humble fisherman with no education, to stand up uh, in Jerusalem in front of people from all over, uh, Jews from all over the then known world in, in the Roman Empire, and, and to speak for him, he can make sure that the, the words leave P Peter's mouth in, in probably Aramaic and Hebrew and reach the ears of all of those people from Parthia and, 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 and other places and that they understand in pure Parthian exactly what Peter is saying. God makes that happen because Peter is willing to go on God's errands. Before, he didn't want to be known as a disciple of Jesus while he's in the courtyard beside the fire and people are saying, aren't you one of those? Oh no! And he uses some, some you know, colorful fisherman language. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not with him. The difference, the difference between that Peter and the Peter that we see in Acts chapter 2 is the Holy Spirit, my friends. That's the only thing that I can see that happens between that experience and, and, and 40, 50 days later to see his mind change, to see him now clearly understanding what it is that Jesus came to do and being willing to do anything that God asks him to do, knowing that God will make it happen. This mind change reminds me of that scripture that tells us, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ. I believe that Jesus fulfilled his promise to put his spirit in the minds of his disciples that day, and they were suddenly able to think like God, they were able to think like Jesus, they were able to see like Jesus, they were able to react like Jesus, they were able to respond like Jesus. This, my friends, is how we pass the big exam 
In fact, I believe this is the only way that we can pass the big exam. Prior to Pentecost, the, 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 the disciples were novices. They made all kinds of mistakes. Oh, I, I, I like this one. Uh, th- there were some guys casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And the disciples rush over to Jesus and say, hey, stop them, stop them. Kind of like, that's our business. You shouldn't let them be in our business. What does Jesus say? If they're not against me, they must be for me. If you see another Christian uh, doing the work of God, uh, are are you going to pray to God, uh, stop him, stop him, he's a Baptist. Or, or like the little thing that I got on YouTube, I don't know who got my number, but they put me on this group, which I quickly got off of, that said, uh, you, know, you know what's happening? You know what the Pope is doing? If, 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 if the Pope, uh, don't, don't, don't stone me for this, but if, if the Pope is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit at any time in whatever he is doing, then what happens is that that human being, because that's what he is, is doing what God wants him to do. Now, if he does other things that God doesn't want him to do, then how different is he to me and you? Not different. Not different at all. So should we, should we fear what he does any more than we should fear what we do? Because the big exam is all about whether or not you are doing what the Heavenly Father has asked you to do. Whether you are listening to the Holy Spirit. Prior to the Pentecost, as I said, the the disciples, I think, were novices in dealing with what God was doing in the world. But after Pentecost, because of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, because of Jesus, because of God's Spirit, they passed with flying colors when they were asked the question, what shall we do, brothers? You had an entire group of people that were struck to the heart by by the message that they are hearing in their own language. And they asked, what shall we do? I don't know if, if anyone asked that question of you this week. That by your simple presence, or maybe a conversation that you had with them, that in not so many words, maybe they asked you, how how can I live like that? How can I be like that? Like you? What, what, What is it that... Did you get a chance, maybe, to answer back? Like Peter answered back. He's he's a sheep now, you know. He's not a goat. He's been changed. He's been changed. He's a real sheep. And he answers back, uh, be, you know, trust Jesus. Be baptized. Re- repent. Come back to God. Repent. Come back to him and be baptized in the name of Jesus. He'd been changed, that guy, Peter. He'd been changed. And he'd been changed because the Spirit was now in him, not because he himself had changed himself. The Spirit was now in Peter. The shepherd looks at the flock and divides the sheep from the goats. I I believe it's the answers. It's the answers that the sheep and goats give that betray their real selves. I looked at it again and again, and I know that it's very, very similar if you, if you compare the answers, but what you, what you come up with, I hope, is the same thing that I've come up with, and that is that, that the, the essence of the difference is the attitude towards God. Amen. The sheep answer, when did we see you? When did we see you? The shepherd says, you did it because, because that's who you are. You did it because the the Spirit of God has taken up residence in you and and now you see people like God sees people. You react to situations the way Jesus would. You respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why you are a sheep. 
Because you, you, you did it even though you don't know that you're a sheep. Because you, you don't check on whether you're a sheep. You just know that you are because this mind of Christ has been put in you. And now what is happening is that Christ is speaking. The goats, on the other hand, well, maybe you just put a different emphasis in that same sentence. And, and it's, when did we see you? <laughs> like, if it was you that we saw, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course we would have, you know, been on duty like those gods that I saw this morning, uh, you know, on, on duty. Yes, of course, if, you know, we knew the king was coming, <laughs> we would be at attention. The Spirit of God was not in them. The Spirit of God was not motivating them. They could not see people. They do not see people. We will not see people if the Spirit of God is not in us. We will not see them the way that Jesus sees them. So that's why I added Micah 6 8. Some of us grew up in the 60s and we, we knew that little song He has shown thee, O man, what is good. These are the cliff notes, by the way. If you want the small version, if you want not to have to read the whole parable in Matthew 25 or the whole of Matthew 25, just, just remember Micah 6, 8. He hath shown thee, O people, what is going to be on the big exam. Do justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. Jesus promises to pass, you ready for this? Jesus promises to pass the exam for you. Any takers out there today? Jesus promises to pass the exam for you from inside your head. I agree with those who say that all the names of the humans on earth that have ever lived have been written in the book of life. The problem is that some of us don't want our names to be there. Because you see, if, if, if you don't have the, the Spirit of God controlling, then basically you are saying, please take my name out of the book. In the wedding today, there was a moment of silence when the music ended and the bride and groom went into the vestry. Is that the right word for it, I think? A little tiny room off to the side and off went Prince Charles and off went Meghan's mother and they were going to sign the registry as a newly minted married couple. It's a British tradition that also is observed in Canada other places in the commonwealth. Their names are now written in the book. I like, though, the idea that your name is already written there. Your name is there. And it's because of Jesus that your name is there. It's because of Jesus that you have come into existence. Now is your time. Idleness is not an option. Now is the time to claim your inheritance. Now is the time to be doing those things that when your examination comes, when it comes, when the, when the, when the great judge comes and says, are you a sheep or are you a goat? That, that the only way that you can pass the exam that you knew now was to have Jesus in your mind. Have, to, have Jesus, have that mind that is in Christ in you. please. Please, I beg of you, do not reject the call of the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about that as being the, we talk about the sin against the Holy Spirit. Well, let's face it, Jesus is the first attempt of God. He is the big attempt of God to win our affections. We read about Jesus in the Bible. My friends, if we reject God's last and, 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 and biggest attempt for each and every one of us made personal by the Holy Spirit, what other way does God have to get into our heads? He's done. He's out of options. 
And so it is that if you want to pass the big exam, I, you know, for Jesus' sake, please ask for the Holy Spirit to enter into your life. Do you want to, do you want to represent your king? Do you, do you want to get that, that well done? Didn't you love that as a kid? I loved it when my teacher would put well done on the bottom of my paper. Isn't that what, isn't that what you're hoping for? 100%, A+. Plus. Then invite the Holy Spirit to, to baptize you anew. Just, just cover you. Just set, send that flame of fire upon you. Our Holy Father is, is waiting to pour down his, his wisdom, His love, His joy, His compassion for others. He's wanting to shower us with these blessings and send us out into a chaotic, confused, and, ca- and cancerous world. Amen. He wants to send us out there with, with hope and with strength and with love for our fellow human beings. The question is, you want to pass the exam? Amen.